Hello and welcome to episode number 42 of the Crisis Intelligence Podcast. Today is Sunday, March 22nd, 2015. I'm Melissa Agnes, and this podcast is brought to you by Agnes Day. Let's talk crisis intelligence. Hi, Roy. Welcome to the show. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us about what you do? Well, Melissa, I am Roy Reed. I am the Director of Communications at the University of Central Florida College of Business Administration here in Orlando, Florida. And I also uh, provide people and and organizations with some coaching as it relates to communications and crisis and the topic that we will talk about today, which is outrageous trust. Outrageous trust. I love that name. <laughs> I love the. I love that it's two words. It's just so short and sweet, but it's it's outrageous trust. <laughs> it's not just you know big trust or great trust or it's outrageous trust. I love that. Well, one of the things that I, I tell people is uh, in choosing the uh, the descriptive word, I wanted something that would grab your attention, which obviously that does. I wanted something that made you think because the word can be used in a positive. And oftentimes a negative sense, but in this particular sense, I'm, I'm, I'm leaning on the definition that talks about something that goes beyond, something that uh, is fantastic, if you will. And uh, in this day and age, you really can't settle for average uh, when it comes to trust, and particularly with the demands that uh, the stakeholder marketplace that we live in now has for us. You're absolutely right. Trust is a big part of my message. So a big part of mm. what I communicate in, in, in the podcast and on my blog and with clients and speaking engagements is that we need to, organizations need to focus on building trust with mm. their stakeholders prior to ever experiencing a crisis so that you can fall back on that and leverage that to your advantage. You have that relationship there. You have the benefit of the doubt. You have these things already in place so that in a crisis, these are powerful resources. They're powerful tools in a crisis. That's exactly right. I enjoyed uh, getting our conversation, getting to know each other, because a lot of similarities in our past and having had a front row seat with uh, many different organizations of all shapes and sizes in the in the midst of their storm, their crisis, if you will, um, the one mitigating factor to success was trust. And those that had been more intentional about it and built it had the opportunity to um, get through it much easier, start the rebuild process much sooner. And those that hadn't had to spend so much more time, energy, and resources, funding and, and programs to to just get to the point where they could begin rebuilding the reputation. And so there's a real economic return on investment for spending your time and energy in a proactive, intentional, and mindful way, uh, building, earning cultivating trust in your culture and and with your relationships. Oh, I like that you just said in your culture. So let's talk a little bit about let's let's talk about how to do that cuz maybe organizations are there and saying, "Yeah, but you know, I've been trying to do that and maybe we're not as as far as we expected to be or mm-hmm. maybe without social media would be a big help there and we just <laughs> don't know where to start or how to go about doing that." But let's start with with the I guess the the trust 101. So okay. how does trust work? You know, what it, what does right. it mean to be a trustworthy organization? Well, let's, let's, um, let's take one more step in the direction of giving people, um, something tangible to hang their hat on. Uh, I like to give organizations six, um, things that they need to look for in terms of what makes you a high trust organization. And, um, you know, it begins with the idea that in 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 the in your culture, there's a certain peace of mind that uh, there's a high degree of integrity, and that things are happening the way they should. People are are doing the right thing in addition to do, doing things right, um, and that there, there's a cost associated with that. In that you you have a lower risk in an organization where that kind of mindset is at play. In a high trust culture, the the second attribute that it has is that things move faster. There's a greater efficiency and effectiveness uh, in the in the process of things. 
uh, because people, when they trust one another, are able to move things through less bureaucracy. Stephen M. R. Covey's book, Speed of Trust, uh, really illustrates this well. Uh, and you reduce cost when that happens. You have a much more uh, clean operation as it relates to that. Um, a high trust culture has a great internal loyalty to it, which means that your retention is higher. And any of us that have been in a position to hire people know that it costs a lot less to keep great people than it does to go hire them and recruit them. Uh, a high trust culture has a, a marketplace or customers and clients that are fiercely loyal. Uh, and those of us who have suffered through the, the last eight years of a down economy know that uh, where we had high trust, we had people that continued to work with us, continued to choose us as their provider of choice, uh, even though we all may have taken a little bit less in the process or made compromises to make that happen because they trusted us, they valued what it is we brought to the table. And then number five, you used the words a minute ago, my four favorite words in a crisis, benefit of the doubt. Uh, when that is available to you, working with a, an organization, working with leaders, uh, it just makes the process work so much better in a crisis. And then the the six, and just as important, obviously, as the other five, uh, your brand is stronger overall. Your presence in the marketplace is seen differently when you're a highly trusted organization, when you're a highly trusted leader in the organization. Uh, your Your brand, your personal brand, is, is much, much better. And that brings us to this point, this idea um, of, of the how-to parts of it. Um, because trust works in a very uh, multiple way, if you will. It's not a single idea that happens. Um, it's, it's many things that happen. And uh, so when I talk to organizations uh, about this, I'll ask the group to list the names of three people that they trust the most. And, uh, and, if, and they'll write them all down. And, and then I ask, put next to each name three or four attributes as to why. And all of the descriptors begin to come in. You know, they care about me. They, uh, they go out of their way to help. They consistently deliver on their performance. They give me the, the things that I need. They got my back. You know, just a variety of different things. And there's two large buckets that define where trust is with people. The first is emotion. It's a very emotional thing that we um, assign certain attributes to people based on. Uh, very personal relationships that we have, family members that are close to us, best friends and, and coaches and those that advise us. We have a great emotional attachment to those people. We trust them with a lot of information, very deep um, things that we may be struggling with. And so that emotional trust is a very important driver. The other side of the spectrum is a, a driver that is based on experience. Uh, the illustration I'll use with a group is that there may be a vendor out there that does a job perfect for me every single time. And because of those experiences, I trust them with that particular job time and time again. But I may have no emotional trust connection with them. So I don't share deep, dark, personal secrets with them. On the flip side, I may have dear friends that I'll trust with my struggles and to watch my children or you know, take care of personal things, but I may never hire them because I know too much about them <laughs> <laughs> on the other end. And so we have this, we have these two both complementary and sometimes competing factors that define what is ultimately a belief or perception that people have in us. And so uh, we feed into these things uh, with our actions. We feed into them with, our, um, with the things that we say and do every day. And so what we'll do over the next uh, uh, few minutes or the time we have together is, is look at trust from a much more granular state than I think most people do and understand that there are very small things that need to be looked at, tweaked, and worked on day in and day out to get to this outrageous level of trust that gives us the kind of um, fruitful, uh, involved relationships that are much more productive and profitable and, and fulfilling in, in our lives. Great. You know, I love that you just clarified the, the two, the, the, you know, the emotional trust and the trust based on experience. Both, I mean, a big part of 
creating, you know, positioning, for example, or getting through the noise, let's even just mm-hmm. go there, mm-hmm. getting through the new noise prior to experiencing a crisis so that you can build that trust, you could build that reputation, that strong reputation that will be there as a foundation for you in a crisis mm-hmm. is very much getting through the noise is trying to push out messages or communicate, not push out, but communicate <laughs> messages that are stories mm-hmm. that, you know, wrapping your messages, your core messages into emotionally compelling stories. And that's how you're going to reach the hearts and then the minds of your stakeholders. So it's, and then to, so that when, as soon as you said emotional, it's like, yes, that's right <laughs> on cue. And then you say also based on experience. So at the same time, you want mm-hmm. to you want to reach the hearts of your stakeholders, but then you also want to be dependable. You want to consistently mm-hmm. deliver and be accountable so that that trust continues to grow. Which So both of those statements, both of those, mm-hmm. um, not even just statements, but descriptions of trust are different, but play into one, each, uh, one another very uh, profoundly. Yeah, and and I'd be remiss if I didn't um, just take a moment and uh, say a couple of things because uh, oftentimes I think when you get on a topic like this, you can uh, it's very easy to come off as as this is what I do really really well and I want you to do it, but I got to tell you uh, I, I I mess I screw this up every day. Um, I'm a human being. You're a human being, and those that are listening are human beings. That is the one common thing we have. Uh, and we will make mistakes, and we will inadvertently do things that can put something in motion that, if not checked and fixed, turns into a an issue which grows into a crisis. And uh, I, I tell a story when I'm when I'm speaking to a group, and I, I shared this with you the other day. I I wear this uh, this bracelet uh, every day. It's a it's a the highest quality plastic bead bracelet that was made by a seven year old little girl. Um, a few years ago, my daughter Faith, and uh, the, as the story goes, I came home on a Friday night, and she had uh, turned our dining room into a bracelet factory, which a lot of the listeners probably recall either by their own daughter or perhaps they were the daughter uh, that that did that. And and uh, as as it, as she was so excited to bring it, she brought the bracelet to me and and said, "Daddy, would you wear this? I made it for you." And of course, I said yes. Uh, understand that my daughter's the youngest of four children and the only girl. So uh, to say I'm wrapped around the finger is an understatement. And uh, so it was a long weekend. We had a great time everywhere we went. Uh, Daddy was show and tell uh, with the bracelet. And and uh, came Tuesday morning, I had to get ready to work and put the suit on and go to a meeting and make a presentation and took the bracelet off, left it on the dresser and didn't give it a second thought and got home that night. The dining room is still a bracelet factory, and I was helping my wife Kim with dinner and in walks Faith with another bracelet, different colored beads, and all I could think at the time was, I only have so much arm to give, and uh, what she said next was was earth-shattering to me. She said, Daddy, if you didn't like the other bracelet, would you wear this one? Oh, it pings your heart. Right. And what makes it so earth-shattering on many levels, one, I'm her father. I would never do anything to hurt her. And uh, I had broken trust with her. And as a communications professional who was just weeks away from delivering this very presentation to a group in California, I was confronted with with a very real experience that says that even in the relationships most important to us, uh, we can inadvertently say and do things that um, cause that breach. And while some may say it's just a plastic bracelet, uh, my retort is how often do we say and do things in the workplace every day that plant seeds or how often do we create a, an environment where people can't speak openly to things that need to happen? And And if that was different, if we were more mindful of the small things and could take this apart and better understand it day in and day out? Would we create cultures where we could avoid some of the great catastrophes that we've seen uh, in the crisis field, whether it's the Enron story or the BP story or pick your favorite one, government, business, or personal? This is an idea that transcends all of those things. And so my hope when I talk with people is that they can take something away that uh, changes them uh, at the core and works in their life, both personally and professionally. So uh, again, I, I make these mistakes every day, but 
my hope is that I'm I'm putting more positive things out there to build trust and being more intentional about that. And if I do it and can influence the people around me to do it, and as you know, working with companies and organizations, it has to be done through the catalysts of people that are willing to make those changes and willing to take these things on. Beautifully said. When, um, you know, talking about you know, taking these actions every day and, and mm. being mindful and making it a part of your core and also saying that we're all human beings. And that's one thing that's actually quite interesting. When you look at crisis as a potential risk, yes, but when you look at it before it happens. So when mm-hmm. you take, for example, say you say, I want to build outrageous trust with my stakeholders and we're going to take actions every day as a culture mm-hmm. to bring us in that right direction. Mm-hmm. In a crisis, what's interesting is that organizations are, are, are made up of human beings and human beings make mistakes like you just beautifully said. And the interesting part is that our stakeholders as well are human beings. And when we connect mm. on a human, on an emotional level, on a trustworthy level, we, you know, our stakeholders don't necessarily, they don't expect the organization to be perfect. Maybe there's a hope there that they'll be perfect. They'll never <laughs> let them down. But the expectation is unrealistic. And the point is that when a crisis strikes, if you've built that human trust, that yes. relatability, that emotional connection prior to experiencing a crisis and in a crisis you come out and you say whatever the scenario you know it always varies but it say something along the lines of we are sorry and we will do everything we've made a mistake and we're holding ourselves accountable to that mistake and we will do everything in our power to fix that mistake and we want to hear from you and we want to hear your story and how potentially this affected or impacted you and how we can do our job better and when you do these things people don't want you to fail right and that's the interesting part is when you're looking at it from i guess maybe um a higher level you're looking down at you know components of crisis and and areas of trust and relationship building, you realize that when you do connect on a human to human level, that in a crisis, that's what it takes as well. You know, often when I do my presentations, I'll say, we teach our children to be mindful, to be respectful, to say that you're their story if they make a mistake, to admit when they're, you know, when they've done something so that we could talk about it and we can grow together, we could teach them. It's the same thing when you're talking to stakeholders and customers and clients right. in as an organization. You know, we are, as human beings, we're wired for relationships. And so we, we have a desire to see those things happen. And oftentimes in the corporate setting, we get so wrapped up in the process of things that we forget that it's that human element, that relationship-based uh, entity, if you will, that that drives everything. It, 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 yesterday, I had the opportunity to speak to a group here on campus, and uh, the vice president uh, for the division is a, is a wonderful lady who uh, is so mindful of of what's happening. and And uh, in the in the midst of our discussions about all the things that that they want to do to ensure that they create this culture, um, she said, "You know, tomorrow there'll be an email, a memo." an edict that comes down or is passed along that that puts a whole lot of numbers in front of us about what we're going to do. And, and don't lose track of the idea that our relationships have to come first if we're going to achieve any of those things that are put in front of us. So if we're not making time to do these things, then we're essentially leaving it to nature to do or leaving it to the outside world and, and your trust in, with people like it or not, can be influenced by outside forces. And so you don't you don't want to leave it in somebody else's hands to make those determinations. And uh, it's critical to understand those things as well. And and so as you look at the two drivers of emotion and experience and, and we can break it down into an even more um, precise, uh, elements, if you will, or or the um, what I call the attributes of outrageous trust. Uh, there's four that we can talk a little bit more about and, and break down into some actionable items. But um, the word that you used a minute ago is trustworthy. Um, trustworthy kind of sits at the at the meeting point of emotion and experience, 
and it's really not the same as being trusted. It's more the congratulations, you've earned the opportunity to be trusted. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about what are some of the specific things that, uh, that comprise this idea of trustworthiness. But as you move up the emotional side of the trust um, model, you find the idea of being authentic uh, as really the second attribute that people are looking for. They want a real connection with you. And today with the, the social media phenomena changing the way people expect to be communicated with and engaged and talked to, authenticity becomes a much more important component to those relationships. Um, and, and one of the things that, that, that we find, we, we've used the word stakeholder a lot in our conversation so far. And I think a lot of what used to be consumers are now stakeholders. I think the whole consumer market is evolving into a stakeholder market where people's demands for involvement, engagement, and influence on the front end of the relationship is is far greater. And so once engaged, it's even more so in the relationship. So authenticity, that second uh, attribute is important. The third attribute emerges along the depend or the um, the experiential scale, and it's a word you used a moment ago. Uh, it's dependability, uh, providing that consistent, reliable performance for people. Uh, and then the fourth attribute, kind of the outlier of all four that would sit on the, if you will, the upper right-hand scale and, and a little bit apart is what I call being influential. And that is making a difference where you are, using the resources and uh, available uh, I, ideas and concepts and strengths to to make a difference in the lives of the people around you. And in People want more of that from organizations. You look at the the emergence and really settling in of the idea of corporate social responsibility. It's it's a it's the idea that I want to trust leaders, people, and organizations that uh, go above and beyond and are about something bigger than themselves. So that's a big one about it is. something bigger than themselves. It is. It is. And so so to get to these. These four places, these four attributes, um, I've outlined a set of guiding principles. And each of the guiding principles is associated with one of the four attributes. In other words, um, as you exercise and live each of these guiding principles, what should manifest uh, in your personal engagement, in the engagement of those around you, and ultimately in your organization uh, would be the uh, the attaining of each of these four attributes, and so the first attri- or the first guiding principle, and the one thing I would hope people would take away from this conversation today is that you have to take responsibility for your relationships. Um, you got to own them. You, they're, you don't rent them. <laughs> uh, they're not part time, and you want to invest and be intentional and mindful with the things that you do. Uh, in, in your world, in the world that I live in, as an example, uh, you can't be a crisis counselor uh, effectively with an organization unless you take responsibility for the relationships that you have. And uh, early in my career, uh, I had the opportunity to lead the communications team at a large hospital system. And as I came on board, um, it was during a time that we all know and love called budget planning. And uh, so we were all sitting around the table lamenting and in some cases trying to figure out how we were going to argue for our piece of the pie. And part of what I was trying to understand from my team was was the relationship we had with some of the executive leadership in the organization. This is a large healthcare system that uh, throughout Florida. And we got to the chief operating officer, and I I found myself becoming more and more frustrated with a lack of information about what his perception was, what his needs were. And it got to the point, and we've all been in the room before where this happens, where the descriptions and the responses were things like, well, he doesn't really understand what we do, or he doesn't care about um, what we bring to the table. You know, all 
culturally embedded in the minds of the people around me. And I went to my boss, um, the vice president, and, and I asked for permission to kind of break protocol and go meet directly with him uh, to find out for myself what his view on things were. And as can be the case in a large organization where you're six or seven positions removed from the point, I set up an appointment with him on a Friday afternoon, and it was for 15 minutes, and he was 10 minutes late. I got five. Just enough time to stick my hand out and say, I'm Roy Reed, your new communications director. How are you? Um, but but here's the point. It opened the door to a successive weeks of meetings where I listened to what his issues were. Um, I had no other agenda for him than for me to know what the priorities facing the chief operating officer were in this organization. And what happens when you do this is that the door opens up for amazing things to happen. And to make a long story longer, um, <laughs> we, we, we forged a relationship where my budget grew, my staff um, were brought into more important elements in terms of proactive things happening. Um, he became reliant on some things that we did that he wasn't fully aware of that we could bring to the table. My boss capitalized on a relationship now that I had forged on behalf of the department. Um, but most importantly, Melissa, the team that I was responsible for began to behave differently as a result of that and some other things. But this kind of being the best illustration of exercising this idea of taking responsibility for the relationships. A um, couple of things about the, this idea, too, that play out. Number one, when you come into a role or you, you, you face something, a lot of times you're going to be held accountable for things that others have done before you. Um, you're going to have to accept that. You don't get to start with a blank slate all the time. And and so if you if you live with this idea, if you'll exercise this idea, it allows you to overcome those things that may have been uh, the sins of those that came before you in the eyes of that other person or the lack of engagement or whatever the issue is. You taking responsibility uh, puts a, a claim on that area that says, I- I'm here to make things happen and do it differently. And then as you lo- as you lead a group, they begin to to see what can happen when that door opens. To get to the relationship place you want to go in doing that, though, you have to be mindful of becoming trustworthy to that person. And this is where the action of taking responsibility and manifesting into this attribute of trustworthiness comes into play. And there, there are eight ideas that comprise the attribute of trustworthiness. And it begins with integrity. Hmm. We can't go on if, if you're not willing to adopt, accept, and live with integrity. And the simplest definition of this, I think, that I've, I've taken on over the years is, is the idea that you're going to do the right thing when nobody's looking and you're not even going to be held accountable for it. And if you, can, if you can act the right way when, when nobody's looking, when nobody's asking you to, when nobody's pressuring you to, then it becomes an easier exercise when the stakes get higher and higher. Integrity means that we subscribe to a set of ethics. It means that we have a true north in our life, something that helps define right and wrong. And if we're a leader, we need to realize that not everyone that shows up in the organization has the benefit of that lesson, either taught to them formally or informally. And so it's incumbent upon us to be clear about the expectations as it relates to what integrity means working in our organization, working with our customers, working with our vendors, working with our community, and be very and give people direction on that. You can't assume it by any means. And sometimes we find that uh, we, uh, you know, I see it a lot with with children. You know how they act and is a reflection of of what they've been told to do. Um, and you mentioned earlier, you know, we we tr- we strive to 
to do that. And then sometimes we don't do it in the corporate setting. We assume that some of the human factors that people leave as we get older. And in fact, I would argue they get magnified as we get older. So the responsibility for telling those uh, stories, providing that background are important that, so that everybody acts with integrity, um, both when it's easy to do and when it's hard to do. Um, the, the, the second concept of trustworthiness is attitude. Uh, a lot of times when I bring that up, people will go, well, you just talked about this lofty idea of integrity and now you're going to talk about my attitude? <laughs> and, and I say yes, because your attitude is the first impression you make on people. It is, it is what will define you um, for, at the very least, the, the, the first hour of the engagement until you have an opportunity to prove otherwise or reinforce it. Um, and, and I tell people the simplest way to test this theory is the next time you eat at a nice restaurant, ask yourself, why are you giving the server the tip you're giving him? And I would argue that attitude has as much to do with it as does the taste of the food, the ambience of the restaurant, because sometimes all of that can wash away if you get treated badly. Um, and the thing about attitude, it's really the only thing we can control on any given day. That's not to say we're going to have tough days. And so an encouragement that I'll give to people is provide your employees, your team, um, your uh, family a, a safe place to adjust the attitude. Uh, in, in the organization, I, I led a public relations uh, firm for 13 years prior to coming to the university. And these eight attributes that I'm talking about for trustworthiness were sort of my annual review with people. And, and the idea of attitude was in our office that nobody needs to know you're having a bad day but you and me. And it's my responsibility as your manager, as the leader of the team, as whatever, to give you a safe place to go contend with that. So if that means coming in the office and blowing up and getting it off your chest and dealing with it, or if that means having a conversation that said, yes, it's okay to go home today, or find a way to adjust that, or just don't let yourself get in the trap of allowing that to cause distrust to take hold in your relationships. And so attitude's important. John, John Maxwell's got a great book called The Difference Maker, and, and the whole book is about attitude. And it's it's one of those really cool short books that you can read on a plane or, or uh, over a weekend. And uh, but it makes this point very clear that um, I think the words that he uses is it's the palette by which people paint their perception of us uh, and the things that we do. So attitudes the second part of trustworthiness. Third is focus. People want to know that you have their priorities at the top of the list. They they when you're engaging with them. As a client once told me, it's easy to, to fail in the organization, and that is you show up to a meeting with me and have 25 things to talk about, and my priority is number seven. And, and people, are, people hear you, and, and the way to focus is to be a great listener, to be somebody who uh, engages in your listening and takes active listening and, and really puts things in order. And if we do that, if we have the right focus, we'll get to the next um, component of trustworthiness, which is uh, initiative. People want to know that you are taking initiative to get things done. You don't need to be told what to do. You're not just an order taker. Um, order takers don't achieve a high level of trustworthiness because they just have to be overmanaged. And those that take initiative are the ones that we allow to do more. And, and you earn more trustworthiness the greater the initiative that you take to do things. Um, the other component, the, the next one is, is insight. Trustworthy people bring great insight to the table. And the way we cultivate that in our lives is we aspire to be a lifelong learner. And we surround ourselves with mentors who are best in practice at what they do. Uh, I had a wonderful experience as an undergraduate here at the university. I'm actually an alumni of the university I work for. My senior year, I went to work for AT&T for a, a man named Randy Barrage. Randy today runs what's called the Florida High Tech Quarter Council. But the first day of my internship, and we joke around that, that it's an internship that I started in 1988 and continues on today because we actually eat breakfast together every Wednesday. 
Um, uh, and so Randy sat me down and he said, there's two things I want you to do and accomplish in this engagement. And at first he hands me a notebook and says, organize what you do, put everything in this notebook, put a table of contents on the front and leave this here every day when you go home. And that way, if you're not here, I can know what's going on and you can keep up with what's going on. Second, and more importantly, I want you to understand that your network of relationships is the key to success in all that you do. And if you learn nothing else from me, learn that it's through relationships that everything happens. And in those relationships, it's all about what you bring to them first and how you help them solve problems. And then when things are tough, when you need something, when you've got an issue, they're there for you. And that's the kind of insight that you get from mentorship that you don't always see and, and, and get from some of the more academic pursuits that we may have in life. So strive to gain insight in all that you do. Mentors are a big uh, personal growth and professional growth. I mean, there's a, there's a saying that you are the average of the five people that you most <laughs> surround yourself with. But no, but I strongly, and, and you have right a choice as a human being. And we've all, well, I don't know if we've all seen this. I know I've seen this personally in my, my life as I, as I guess I suppose I grow older, um, that you, You're ageless, you have a choice. Well, no, but I mean, grow older <laughs> with experience and you, you can That's... kind of look back on the last decade, for example, and say, right. where were you 10 years ago? Where are you today? And what happened along the way to bring you there? And mm. one of the biggest influences that I've seen in my life is that we have the choice of who we're going to surround ourselves with. And when we're lucky, we can bring that to the business world too. But when you do that with your personal life, you can then, it it kind of follows suits that you can then do that in your business life. Mm. And um, a lot of people choose, for whatever reason, different reasons, to probably not necessarily, you know, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of toxic in, Mm. in bad relationships And when you choose to surround yourself with people who encourage you, who push you further, who want to, who make you want to be a better person, who Mm. you respect and admire and look up to, as opposed to surrounding yourself with, you know, other types of people, it's immense how quickly you grow and how your ambition and your productivity and your um, aspirations and your inspirations just magnify, they amplify. it, that's so, so well put. And in and, and gaining insight, don't limit yourself to business. Uh, I have mentors in my life that span a variety of elements in my life for that very reason you said, and that is to push me beyond the bounds of what I currently think I can do. Um, I One of my passions in life, I, I teach and train in the martial arts and I currently hold a fourth degree black belt. I saw that on your website. (laughs) I thought that was so fascinating. I'm learning about outrageous trust and your message. And then hey, there's (laughs) pictures of you, you know, knocking down (laughs) cinder blocks or whatever it is with your pants. Like, cool. Three dimensional. Part part of part of why I do that is for the reason you just said. I have I have instructors who are masters, mentors to me. Um, whose job is to take me to that next place, to, to, to help me strive to that. And an interesting parallel, um, trustworthiness to me is exemplified in a black belt in the martial arts. And by that, I, I mean most people who observe martial arts from the outside in assume that the black belt is sort of the end of the journey. Congratulations, you got there. In fact, it's the beginning of the journey to the martial artist. It is the congratulations, you've earned the opportunity now to begin sharing with others, to begin understanding the boat, the healing and um, fighting side of the martial arts. It's the, it's the way in which now you have chosen to live your life. And trustworthiness is that same thing. It's the beginning. It's, it's, it's where the world begins to open up now and you can earn more opportunities and, and do more and take other people on with you and, and bring them to that next level as well. And um, and, and, and it's funny in, in one of our tests one year, my instructor walked out on the floor as, as we were testing for, I think it was my second degree. And he, he did the first form you ever learn as a martial artist, which when you start, you get a white belt and then you get a yellow belt and then it's green and blue and on up the 
scale. And, and there's eight levels that you strive to before you get to black belt, just as there are eight um, principles of trustworthiness that, that we'll talk about. But he did this form and he did it flawlessly. And he said, what level form did I just do? And half the group said, you did a white belt form. And he goes, no, I didn't. He said, I did a black belt form. He said, once you've gotten to this level, you should always perform at the place where you are. And I, I see trustworthiness as that same measure that we always should perform these ideas of integrity and, and focus and insight and attitude and, um, and the rest that we'll share in just a minute at, at a level that is higher uh, than average. Obviously, I'll go back to my word outrageous. <laughs> so, um, Which is important because right. everybody, the average is all around us. And if we want to stand out and we want to be remarkable and we right. want to build those relationships above and beyond, then we have to be outrageous. So three more attributes to share in trustworthiness. Um, perseverance is one. Uh, as a crisis manager, as a communicator, we know firsthand that that one of the things people want to know is that you're not going to cut and run when it gets hard. Uh, life is hard. There's a great an analogy that was shared with me years ago, and I use this in my presentations all the time, that life is about the storm. You're either in the middle of it, coming out of it, are getting ready to go back into one. And when you persevere, you get to the next level. You learn something different. You, um, you earn the right to come back. And you are somebody that truly makes a difference in other people's lives. So perseverance is um, number six. Number seven is excellence. Trustworthy people deliver their best work first. Um, again, you won't always get it right, but people know when you've put your best effort to it and you know, you know, there, there, there are those days where you hit sin to give somebody something and you know, Oh, I missed. Um, and again, to your point earlier, there, there, if you're consistently trustworthy, you can make the apology and make things right and go back and fix, but always strive to deliver excellence in what you do. And the last, um, and again, equally important to the other seven is vision. Trustworthy people have vision. They, they do this for a higher th reason. It's not all about them. Um, they're willing to, to step in and serve. They're willing to um, step in and, and, and give the example. They're willing to do the things that they're asking others to do. And, and vision is both about having your sight set on something higher, but bringing other people along with you as you go, um, not plowing through people, not plowing over them, not dragging them, but, but shepherding them to come along with you. And so those eight ideas, um, integrity, attitude, focus, insight, initiative, uh, perseverance, excellence, vision, those define the idea of trustworthiness. And, and that gets you to the place where you've earned this opportunity uh, to become trusted with others. Beautifully said. I love that, you know, I think that we think, or possibly a lot of professionals, organizations, they think, okay, we need to be trustworthy, great, and we need to build trust with our stakeholders. How do we do that? I love that this concept of, and it runs right consistently with, with my messages that I'm always trying to communicate, is that it starts with the internal culture. Mm -hmm. It starts with building a corporate culture that lives and breathes this mindset, because that's what it is. It's a mindset and a practice. And once you have that internally, one, then you'll trust your employees and your team mm. to go on and extend that. But when you're living and breathing this high trust culture, it's just systematic. It's just uh, normal that it will leak out into with your, with your external stakeholders and it'll be a part of your corporate brand mm -hmm. and your, your identity, your reputation, all of that. So the place to start, people, is internally well, <laughs> with yourself and then with your team. You are a fabulous segue provider. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the second guiding principle is to build trust from the inside out. And uh, again, to your point, I, I can't expect you to do something I'm not willing to do myself. And if I'm not holding myself accountable to those things um, by the people I surround myself with and by the organization, the way it's structured, the culture, and otherwise, then uh, it's just not going to happen. 
Uh, so one of the exercises that I'll have people do coming out of the idea of taking responsibility is I'll ask them to identify three people in their life, somebody that they currently have a good relationship with, somebody that they need to build a relationship with, and somebody that they need to repair a relationship with. And to take those eight ideas of trustworthiness and and reflect on themselves, which of those are most important in accomplishing those three things, building a new relationship, cultivating a current relationship, or repairing or restoring trust in a relationship, and then determine how will I know that trust is flourishing in those three relationships when we get there, and then set out to do one of those three things, cultivate the current, build the new, repair the broken. And it it really forces people to look inside and say, have I done the things most important in creating, sustaining, or restoring these relationships? And that that then manifests and opens the door to this idea of creating authenticity in our relationships. And and there's five things that that have to happen to be truly authentic in, in the relationships that we have. And the first one is we have to have real clarity of purpose in what we're doing. So in the personal relationships and the work relationships, what is it that you're all about? What is it that you're doing? Uh, I'll do an exercise with these groups where I'll have them pair off and they'll, they'll, um, they'll have to accomplish a task um, with very conflicting information in each of the roles that they've been given to play. Um, each of them are trying to gain something out of it and it's a small thing, but they think it's a bigger thing. And so immediately they start the debate over who's got the more needy uh, opportunity, who's got the better cause, who's got, when in fact none of that matters because they're really not after the same thing. They're after two different things. And that purpose, when they, when they realize what their real purpose is, instantly they can trust each other or at least it opens the door to trust each other to get what they need to get done and they can do it for half the price. So the case that they're working on suddenly becomes a completely different thing because they have that clarity of purpose. And oftentimes we don't give that to people. We get busy. We let things cloud up. We let things get in the way. The day-to-day begins to do something. And we, get, we say yes to too many things. We don't let people say no to things. And, and now there's not clarity of purpose. And so we lose sight of where we're going and it muddies the relationships. Once we have clarity of purpose, we have to agree that we're going to respect everyone. You can have disagreements. You can walk away and agree to disagree. Um, But if you don't give people the dignity that they deserve when they walk out of the room, then you will not earn the right to engage with them in the future. And you will see relationships crumble when respect is not what drives the conversation. So respecting everyone is a critical aspect to creating authenticity. Once you have respect, then you can exercise candor in your relationships. You can speak openly about problems. You can address issues that are important. And perhaps the most important thing about candor in terms of long-term viability of trust is the idea of the blind spot. Uh, There's a great model out there called the Johari window. You may have seen it in your work and and others have seen it in their work. It's a simple idea that takes a four quadrant system and says on one side of the plane that there are things that others know about us and things that others don't know about us. And on the other plane that runs into that one, there are things we know about ourselves and there are things that we don't know about ourselves. And so you can plot different ideas on the four quadrants that you build from that. But the most important one for this exercise is that there's a place that we don't know about ourselves that others do. And that's our blind spot. The little actions we do every day that we don't think about or the way we say things or the the facial expressions we make or whatever it may be that that causes others to to conflict with us or to not see things clearly because that gets in the way. And, and the example I would use is I'm I had the opportunity to serve on a bank board 10 years ago and I was really honored to be asked. And it was the first time I'd been on like a, a board like that. 
first meeting I show up at coincided with the first week that I got a BlackBerry. And we all remember that, that beautiful moment where we realized we could actually answer all of our emails in a day. Now, like rabbits, emails have multiplied that nobody can answer all their emails in a day. But on that particular day, I was having this email issue where a client had said, I've got a crisis. Can you help me? And I'm at this meeting and I thought, well, this will just take a second. <laughs> Famous last words. And I answered the email. Well, when you answer an email, it makes another email happen. And so they followed up and I followed up. And the next thing you know, for the next hour, I'm kind of in this email conversation sitting amongst these other board members. So I get back to my office and one of my employees comes in and somebody who I just have the most high respect for and we had a great working relationship. She says, how was the board meeting? And I said, it was great. She goes, how do you know? And I'm like, I'm sorry. She said, well, I got a phone call from somebody that was there and they said that you didn't participate. You were completely disenfranchised from the rest of the group and that you were preoccupied with your toy for the entire meeting. And so I was mortified. Now, as a leader, as the person in charge, I had two options. I could tell her to get back to work and leave me alone, which I think a lot of people are afraid that's what they're going to hear when they're candid with somebody that they work for. Mm -hmm. Or I could take action. And uh, in this case, I, I got on the phone and I called people and I apologized for my actions and uh, would not have known had she not felt comfortable enough to call out my blind spot to me. But that's that's the kind of culture we want to we want to create, and I and I have to ask sometimes how many of these monumental crises that we've seen over the years could have been averted if one employee felt empowered to say at Enron, this is not the way we should be doing business. You know, or, sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. That's no, just, and you're absolutely right. And I think a big challenge there is the fact that again, back to the fact that we're all human beings. <laughs> and no, but seriously, I think right. that a lot of people have don't self evaluate. They're right. they the truth hurts when we hear something. You know, you're right. You could have taken her um, her honesty as get back to work, or you could have praised her and said thank you so much for being courageous enough, telling me the truth because now I can fix this and, and yeah. I've also learned a lesson. But that takes a specific type of human being to be able to do that, and then of course to develop that corporate culture. And mm. I think that uh, we all should strive to be that. I mean, this goes back to being mindful and it goes back to listening and all these attributes that you're talking about. But I do think that that's part of the problem is that yeah. when we're not able to be like that with ourselves, then we can't build that corporate culture and we can't bring that um, outrageous trust outward with our external stakeholders as a representation or as a foundation of the entity, the, the organization's brand in itself. So I guess <laughs> that's a dilemma. So, but it I is, think that people is. listening are self-reflecting because if you're turning into my podcast, you're learning a whole bunch of stuff every week and yeah. you're, you're strong enough and uh, a leader to want to go and implement this stuff. So the good news is that the, I believe that my listeners are <laughs> strong enough to do this stuff. But um, back to you know Exxon and and different major major crises that have happened, it's hard to be that person, and we yeah. have to take the conscious effort every day. You know, I always say, especially in in personal life, when I'm talking with friends or family that have personal struggles, I say, you know, working on yourself is really really hard. <laughs> it's there's no weekends. No there's doubt. no we can't take. Um, you know, I'm gonna stop being the best me on Saturday and Sunday. You can't That's do right. that, <laughs> and it's very hard to self reflect and. Once you you start doing it and it becomes a part of your DNA, then it become then you're open to those those that feedback and that criticism, and you take it as a positive. But you have to get there first, and sometimes it's really hard to be in an organization where the leader just isn't capable of doing that. Right, and we've all been there, and so th there are going to be times where you're going to have to muscle up the courage in the face of a leader that doesn't allow for that. And um, and it's it's interesting too. Let me. I'll put a finer point on this uh, this bank board story because it's 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 a nice little warm fuzzy ending that 
um, I was able to to know that blind spot and have an employee that told that. But the there's a financial return to this story too because one of the other board members was the CEO of a hospital in town. And four or five years later, when he needed somebody that he could trust to help navigate through a crisis that was looming on their horizon, he called. And what I'm convinced of, Melissa, is that if all he knew of me was the bank board meeting incident, I would have been, I would have been not on the list at all. But because I was willing to take my lumps, um, confront something that needed to be dealt with, even as small as it may sound, it, it, there's a certain comfort that comes from being with people in times of crisis who are uh, able to accept that kind of feedback and act on it mm-hmm. and do the and do the right thing. It's not actually small, not in this case. This is your this is your first day in a board meeting yep. on a board yep. that you've been asked to join and this is the perception yep. of your colleagues of who you are yep. and how present you are at and how how what type of importance you put to this meeting or to this You're uh, right. So it's it's not small. <laughs> and then you know, one of the things to to keep going this leads to is is the uh the next important part about authenticity is that when you're going to be candid with other human beings things are going to happen so we have to be able to exercise forgiveness in our relationships and i don't want people to read the wrong thing into this um forgiveness is not about the other person it's about yourself in this case it's about Having the ability to, yes, be mindful of not making the same mistake twice or, or not putting yourself uh, in a position to be wronged again, and, but to let go and to keep moving forward, um, to not let things become such a burden on you that it inhibits you from building the relationships that you have. When you put yourself into a place where you're taking responsibility for the relationships and you're you're striving to build trust, you will be vulnerable at times. You will be wronged by other people at times. And you have to have the ability to forgive so that you can move forward. I mean, they may never accept it. It's not about that. It's not, uh, that's a whole different idea about forgiveness. But this one in particular says, I'm, I'm going to let go and go on. And I'm not going to let things keep me from living the life of trust that needs to be lived, of seeking authentic relationships where I can, and of and of gaining the opportunity to to move relationships in the right direction. So we have to have a place to exercise forgiveness. And and and, and let me go back to, to candor and forgiveness as a complete set for a moment. One of the other I mentioned earlier that with attitude you want to provide people a safe place. Candor requires that a leader provide people a safe place. And uh, I was working with a hospital team a couple of years ago, and and this became the issue for them is that, you know, how do we as leaders assure in this 24-7 operation that people always know there's a safe place to go be candid and and, and not feel under threat for sharing things? So uh, we've got to provide that and then encourage people to forgive. Um, one of the other elements of this is that we have to operate – Uh, and be present in people's lives. Uh, We have to, we can't do this um, via email and electronic all the time. We've got to make time to be face-to-face with the people in our immediate relationship matrix, those uh, family and people that work for us and people that we deal with. You know, years ago, there was this great um, commercial that one of the airlines ran uh, where the boss brought in everyone to the boardroom and said, um, uh, here's where you guys are going to all, and he just starts handing out airline tickets and says, you guys are going to go visit all of our customers now. You know, we are the, we are about building those kind of relationships and that presence matters to people um, in, in terms of engagement. And then finally, in, in terms of authenticity, all of this coming together, we have to have it uh, act in a, in a high degree of transparency. Uh, our actions have to match our words. We have to be consistent in the things that we do versus the things that we say. And, uh, and, and even more so today than any other time because we're always being watched. There's not a time when we're not being um, out there. Social media has put us out there. Um, 
24-7 media coverage has our, our companies out there. Uh, you know, it's like last night, we had this wonderful story break uh, for the university. You might have seen it play out where Robert Downey Jr. Um, met up with a kid in, who needed a, a prosthetic arm and, and gave him one that looks like the Iron Man arm. Hmm, I can see that. It was built by some students here at the university using 3D printers. They're they're building these uh, arms for these kids that cost hundreds of dollars, not thousands. And Robert Downey Jr. helped them give a kid a hope. And, and I use that illustration because you know that started to break at six or seven o'clock last night. Um, so the university goes on display in the evening and it runs all through the night and on into today. And, you know, 10 years ago, that might have been a story that started at six or seven in the morning and ran to noon, but it's being shared continually across all of our social feeds right now. So that transparency has to be there. This in the case of a good news story, but oftentimes we see the downfall of an executive or a company uh, because they're not being transparent when things break on them. And within 24 hours, we see careers that are ruined. So authenticity is comprised of understanding and having clarity of purpose, being present in people's lives, showing respect for everyone, uh, being candid in in the things that need to happen, exercising forgiveness, and and, and ultimately having the transparency uh, that's necessary. Yeah, being honest. Yes. uh, Absolutely. 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 Um, The next guiding principle is that we need to communicate consistently. And um, I like to say, if you don't tell your story, others will. And they may not have your best interests in mind. And and communication really at a foundational level is the dependability element. It it manifests in dependability because uh, even, even when we do things, if we do it well, we want to make sure people know. But if we don't do it well... We need to let people know why. Uh, we need to stay engaged with people. We need to um, let them know more about who we are and what we're all about. The uh, Edelman Public Relations has the trust barometer. It's a wonderful tool. comes out uh, every so often. And one of the areas that is interesting at year after year is that they have this idea that they ask people, how many times do you need to hear a message before it resonates with you? And consistently, they say three to five times. And what I tell people is, let's put that into the context of our relationships, right? What is three to five in the scheme of 12 months, 365 days, or 52 weeks? It's not a lot. So how often are you reaching out to people just to touch them, just to, just to contact them, just to stay engaged with them? And, and an illustration from a marketing standpoint, um, I worked for a, a law firm for all the years that I was at my PR firm. And the first marketing campaign we did with them was a, a client cultivation strategy that dealt with going to visit the client, sitting down and asking them how they were doing and engaging in some conversation with them, communicating to them both about what their business needs were and about what the firm was. And in 85% of those visits, they got new business. It's amazing when we communicate, when we open up, when we're proactive, what can happen and what we can learn from and do. And then it should manifest in a greater sense of dependability. And and dependability is that attribute that really defines the brand. Because brand, as we know, is simply a promise delivered. And when we tell people we're going to do something, when we achieve that, we've delivered on that promise. And so you look at the brands that we're attracted to both as individuals and organizations and consistently we find they're dependable. Um, Some brands are dependably delivering a consistent, reliable, great performance and others not so much. Hmm. Um, They dependently fail us. (laughs) Right, right, right. (laughs) And and there's, you know, from a a dependability standpoint, there's four things that, that we look for. Are you fully engaged in what you do? Uh, not just showing up, not just marking time, but really engaged in the relationship for making things better. Do you uh, deliver on time or early? And if you're going to miss the delivery, if you're going to miss the deadline, do you call and help to manage the expectations um, around it? Um, Third, do you give a consistent, reliable performance? And then fourth, are you evaluating um, 
all of your inter- interactions. Uh, what what matters most deserves to be measured. Um, so how are you doing that? How are you asking what are the three things we could do better next time? How are you rewarding behavior that continues to to produce that kind of results? I love the example that is coming out of companies like Zappos right now mm-hmm. where – um, the opportunity to talk with Tony Shea and, and see what he was doing, but um, where the operators at a call center are rewarded for keeping people on longer to learn more about them so they can serve them better next time rather than making them feel like they got to get them off the phone and get to the next call. You know, Zappos is one of those leading organizations that if you really want to learn or see an example of creating this amazing corporate culture that then leaks and bleeds out and rep- and is is just a fact of or a matter of um, the actual brand identity Zappos is an amazing example of that it, no doubt and you know I tell people I had the opportunity to to actually meet Tony Shea at a conference one year and the day that I met him was the day that he announced to his employees in the conference room next to the one we were meeting at that Amazon had bought him out for a billion dollars. Mm-hmm. And you got to wonder what motivated that. And I like to think that somebody at Amazon woke up one day and said, what if they start selling books? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. And you know, when I saw, um, there's a video, I think it was on Zappos website. I'm not sure where I came across it, but it was basically the employees talking on camera candidly. Mm-hmm. And they were saying this company taught me how to be a better human being. And because of that, I've applied this. You know, I'll take that extra minute to hold some the door open for somebody while I'm on my way into the grocery store. That's or right. Or I'll take... And literally, this corporate culture that they've developed has changed the lives of their employees, which then in turn changes the lives of everybody they come in contact with during the work hour as well as on personal time. That's right. That's right. And... So anyways, making sure that we're dependable, you know, fully engaged, delivering on time and early, giving that consistent, reliable performance and evaluation makes a difference. And, and so the, the fourth guiding principle um, from communication we go to being a good steward of your trust. Um, and stewardship has two sides to it. One is to an earlier point we made, if you're going to be the the average of the five people you hang around with, I would say that you're going to be judged based on the company that you keep. So you've got to be mindful that you are holding everyone accountable to these same high standards in terms of, of being trusted that you yourself are going to live by. And stewardship also says that you're willing to go out and do more, be above and beyond and, and, and put your resources to work in ways that make a difference. And, and there's five attributes to people that truly are influential and make a difference. They, they first and foremost, uh, they make a choice to get engaged and they're decisive about their choice. Their yes is yes, their no is no. Um, but once they're engaged, then the second thing is that they make these full commitments to the things that they do. Um, they either do it publicly or they do it physically in a way that holds them accountable to it. They get it done. Once they've made that commitment, they have um, the desire to get the competency necessary to get the job done. That may mean seeking out further education or having the humility, which is that attribute that I gained when my daughter showed me the bracelet issue, um, that humility that says, I need somebody else who can do this better than me to come help me with that. And when they do that, then they can confront the good, the bad, and the ugly um, of what needs to happen. Uh, Jim Collins writes about that in Good to Great, that that companies um, that really are able to get to greatness have that capacity to confront those things. And then once they've done all that, people who make a difference, who exercise great influence, they, um, they're able to, they have courage to finish. And that is the big difference maker in, in getting those things done. So um, making the right choices, making the commitments to do what need to be done, um, finding the right competency, confronting the good, the bad, and the ugly, and, and having the courage to finish um, are those things that, that help us become influential. And um, exercise great stewardship with the trust that we have. 
And, and when you package all of these things up, one of the things that I encourage organizations to do is create a monument, memorialize these things, put them in front of people and places and things that they do. One of the exercises that uh, I'll do with, with groups that I get in front of to work out is to create a contract uh, of trust with one another, saying here are the five or ten things that we're going to consistently do here in our organization to ensure that on a regular basis we're uh, making deposits of, of positive things into that trust uh, account, or Stephen Covey called it an emotional bank account in the in the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. But what are we doing day in and day out? What behaviors do we want to reward? What are the actions that we're going to take and and really memorialize those things. Uh, I have a hospital client I mentioned earlier, and, and uh, the executive team crafted a 10-point contract, and everybody on the team signed it. They, they hang it, an enlarged version of it, in, in the HR department. And if they bring a new person onto the team, two people will onboard that person over lunch with the contract, and they'll all re-sign a new one and hang that up in HR so that now all the employees know this is how our leadership expects us to build those relationships, to foster that kind of culture and create outrageous trust in everything that we do. Beautiful. Beautifully said and such an important message um, with so many takeaways. I mean, I think that everybody is at a different, probably at a different stage within mm. these four attributes or principles. Um, and so wherever you are, whether it's, you know, okay, we need to start with this internally or we have this internally. How can we bring this out now? How can we take mm. this same model and apply it with our external stakeholders and do these, uh, you know, just, I guess, communications campaigns or something that, that helps to foster this and, and build this, this reputation of outrageous trust. Right. Absolutely. And it all goes hand in hand with this is, this is actually, I mean, this is a good model for business period, but it's, yes talking about, you know, me, I'm all about crisis, right? So talking about crisis preparedness, this is one of the most powerful things you can do as a crisis preparedness strategy. No doubt. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to share it with you. Well, I'm so happy that you did. And I hope that listeners, like I said, I think that there's tons of takeaways here. So no matter where they're at, I think that we gave people something to think about. But if people want to go and learn more about you and your program or follow you, where can they where can they do that? Where can they find and follow you? At RoyWReed.com. Uh, I've got a website up there. There's actually a uh, there's a small exercise available on the front page. They can download and take a look at it. It's got the exercise I talked about earlier and kind of introduces the the basic ideas of outrageous trust. And then throughout there, there's some additional media that they can click on and, and hear more about what we've talked about today. Excellent. And are you on social? I am. I'm on Twitter at Roy Reed, R O Y R E I D, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, and uh, Instagram. Sounds good. All right. So your links will be below, well, it will be in the show notes below this podcast, no matter where you're listening to it from, whether that's melissaagnes.com, iTunes, or Stitcher. Roy, thanks so much for taking the time to really dive and d into this and dis dissect it uh, with so many actionable takeaways for listeners. Well, thank you for the opportunity and if uh, look forward to maybe doing some more in the future. Look forward to it as well. Thank you for tuning in and listening to this week's episode of the Crisis Intelligence Podcast with me, Melissa Agnes. I release a new episode every Sunday, so if you haven't done so already, be sure to subscribe to this Crisis Intelligence Podcast on iTunes or Stitcher so you don't miss out on any future episodes. While you're at it, feel free to leave me a rating or review on iTunes. This will go such a long way in helping me get this important information to more people just like you to help benefit their crisis management and crisis communications. Additionally, if you'd like to have me come and speak at an upcoming event that you may be organizing, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you. You can email me at melissa at melissaagnes.com. Thanks so much for tuning in this week, and I look forward to talking even more crisis intelligence with you next Sunday. 